Welcome everyone. I'm very glad that you're joining us for Local Food Futures. We are so honored to be part of this conference. Uh, I personally think it's one of the best in the world. And I'm so honored and so happy to have as my guest here, Andre Loy, the head of Regeneration International and Nelson Mazingwa, who is doing fabulously important work for, as a voice from the entire global South, as a smallholder and organic smallholder, understanding the absolute need for food sovereignty and collaborating with Via Campesina, which again, I would say is the most important organization in the world, trying desperately to educate the world about the importance of small scale diversified farming. So we're going to start with Andre, who has a presentation with slides. And after that, Nelson, and then I'll come last. We're going to try to keep our presentations to roughly 10 minutes each. So first of all, to you, Andre. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Helena. And it's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk about the whole issue of local, what we call regenerative, biodiverse, organic agriculture and how it can nourish the world. And I wanted to start with food insecurity. The food insecurity, what, and how we define food insecurity, it's actually a period of time when people actually don't have food to eat, when children go to bed hungry. And it, it's been, it was decreasing up until the mid 1990s, and now it's been increasing all around the world. The issue is that food insecurity has increased since the widespread adoption of industrial agriculture. And this is a system based on GMOs, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers to supply distant commodity markets. And I want to give you an example here is if you look at the um, the chart to your left, and this is from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, you can see that food insecurity was decreasing. And then in the mid 1990s, it starts to creep up again. And, and if you look at the chart, the bar graph to your right, that is um, the increase in GMOs being planted, you know, the whole issue of um, you know, industrial agriculture. And you can see that food insecurity increases with the increase in GMOs. And this is not an accident because GMOs aren't done for food. They're not eaten. They're done for commodities. And it's a major problem. So I want to talk about how putting industrial agriculture into systems actually leads to food insecurity. And the best example is in Africa and it's called the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And this is founded by the Bill and Melinda Gates and the Rockefeller Foundations. It was launched in 2016 and it had the vision of doubling agricultural yields and incomes for 30 million smallholder farmers in Africa. It had um, the goal of halving both hunger and poverty in 20 African countries by 2020. It received over a million, a billion dollars from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the US, UK and German governments. And this money was spent to promote industrial agriculture to supply distant commodity markets. And it's based on GMOs and poured as synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. So what happened? Instead of halving hunger, the situation in the 13 focus countries actually deteriorated. The number of people suffering from extreme hunger during the, the agri years increased by 30%. I want, if you look at the, the chart at the bottom, 
and look at Africa, you can actually see that in that period, 2005 to 2020, the Agri years, around 100 million extra people ended up being undernourished. And the reason for this is because by putting industrial agriculture and putting in monocultures, reduce crop diversity. The whole thing here is what they did is they also reduced diet diversity. The foods that people used to eat like millet declined by 21%. Cassava declines. We start looking at roots, tubers, um, they decline, groundnuts. Because the whole issue was just to concentrate on one crop maize, which goes to distant commodity markets instead of growing good traditional foods from farmer seeds to feed the family. The issue here is where Agra is wrong, is that we do not have a shortage of food in the world. At the moment, the world produces actually close to three times the amount of food that we consume. Most of it is wasted. We have no problem of a food shortage. The problem is distant commodity market systems and financial markets actually speculate on food as commodities. And the big issue here is that the hungry are too poor to buy these commodities. On the other hand, we have wealthy countries and a developing world middle class that actually have too much food. So we've got, we're getting, you know, at the same time, we're getting an obesity problem, type two diabetes and, and so on. We're getting two problems, one from too much junk food and on the other side, people not being able to eat food. So the key is local food sovereignty. And if we look at who the hungry are, 80% live in rural communities. So actually, the majority of hungry people are actually smallholder farmers. On the other hand, when we look at who produces most of the food we eat, remember, industrial agriculture only produces 30% of the food. Most of what industrial agriculture produces are commodities. It's food for, um, to make biofuels for you know, tractors and cars and, and so on. It's not food that people eat. Most of the food is smallholders, particularly according to FAO in the global south, 80% of the food comes from smallholders. So what we're seeing, the very people who produce most of our food are the very people who are the hungry, the undernourished. So we need to turn this around. And what I want to say here, the first market is the kitchen table. Put food on the kitchen table first with kitchen gardens. We need to grow food locally by smallholder farmers and supply local communities first. This is the key. And we also need to train or help these farmers to improve their farming systems. And they're, they're, I've got a list here of different ways we can do it. I think it's really, I'm not going to, because of time, go into it. But I think one of the really important things is to talk about things like agroecology to actually increase the biodiversity of the systems. And it leads to significant increases in yields. When I was president of IFARM Organics International, um, we were involved in these sort of projects. And around that time, two UN organizations looked at 114 projects in Africa look, that looked at organic and agroecological systems. And they found when you worked with the farmers and showed them how to um, improve their traditional systems with these simple agroecological and organic tools, we ended up with an average of 116% increase in yields across all of Africa. I think what's really important, what the report also pointed out, is that um, we, you know, that since the introduction of industrial agriculture in Africa, food production is 10% lower now than it was per person than it was in the 1960s. And what they said here is the evidence shows that organic agriculture is more conducive to food security. And I want to end with one of the projects that 
we worked on a one of, I should say one of our member organizations worked on and this is in Tigray in Ethiopia and this is mm. an area that at, at the time ended up with serious um, um, you know, serious food shortages and famines where thousands of people died and by bringing in the whole of an agroecological approach regenerating the system rehabilitating the the, the, the hillsides, bringing in fertilizer trees, fava beans, making compost. They ended up getting over um, 100% increase in yields. Turned it around from where a system where people were dying to where people now were in what we'll call relative prosperity. It, and if you look at these bars here, the middle green bars where they use compost, the um, the smallest bar is the traditional system. When they add compost, more than 100% in yield, and that was higher. The next bar is chemical fertilizers. They actually got more um, yield from compost. And compost is free. Chemical fertilizers put them into debt. And I'll just end here because I'm out of time. I just want to give you an example. This is in Ethiopia. This is a field of wheat. And there's... Um, weather conditions that cause uh, stripe rust. The wheat grown on compost doesn't have any of it. The wheat grown with the chemical fertilizers um, gets the stripe rust and now has to be sprayed with uh, toxic fungicides. The chemical wheat got 1.6 tonnes of uh, you know, per hectare, despite the fact it's sprayed. The composted got 6.5 tonnes a hectare. And compost is made on farm locally at no or very little cost. So what I want to really end on on this is it's really important. The majority of farms in the world are smallholders on two hectares or less, you know, five acres or less. They produce 80% of the food in the global south. Training them on regenerative organic agriculture based on the science of agroecology dramatically increases yield. The Industrial agriculture system, synthetic pesticides, fertilizers, and GMOs supplying distant commodity markets has failed. So we need to refocus agriculture on local production systems based primarily on regenerative organic agriculture to primarily supply local markets. This is the evidence-based way to end food insecurity and nourish the world. So thank you. Andre, thank you very much. And I, Nelson, we are now hoping that you can give your presentation. And I, I want to mention that you are the coordinator, the national coordinator of this Zimbabwe Smallholder Organic Farmers Association. And, and, and that you feel, well, actually you'll speak um, in your own words, but it's a great honor to have you here. And as I said before, I think the work you're doing that is a really important model for the whole world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharina, for giving me this um, very important opportunity to uh, make my presentation, to share my experiences to the rest of the world. Let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, our experiences on local food systems. Yeah, this is really based on our understanding, really on our spirituality and cosmovision, whereby we are a people who have a history and we are a people who have inherited the land where we are producing our food. And I'm just to give a little bit again to my background. I'm one of those. Um, uh, officers who used to support communities uh, in, in training and giving all the necessary support to develop the farmers. But I actually graduated from that level and to become a farmer because sometimes when you, you are talking, you are not, not showing exactly what are the issues that farmers are supposed to be to understand and how are they supposed to get that information, you know, and some of it, you must feel it when you are really on the ground. So I, I will talk about our experiences over uh, a period of right now about 21 years when we 
Zimbabwe actually entered into a process of a land reform program. And from that period, there was a lot of um, impact on the economy of Zimbabwe from external forces. But how did we as indigenous uh, Zimbabweans actually uh, develop some safety nets and protected ourselves, especially on the food? Because when you have got food on the table, it means everything in the household is quite in order. When we look at uh, food systems, you know, we have our knowledge that we believe this is what we understand when we, we're talking about food. We believe that um, food is our basic right, that we should have access anytime we want to, to eat, and that we should have choice and must know how it has been produced. We need to understand you know, who is producing the food that we are eating and we need to have control over it. This is what we believe when we are talking about food sovereignty. It means I have, must have food on my table. We believe that food connects us to our diverse cultures where people with a history and there's that connection with our food and there's that connection with the crops that we actually grow in our local areas that we need not to lose. We believe that food is connected again to or diverse ecosystem, even if you walk in the forest, you can see that there are different tree species that are living together. You can see that there are also fruit trees, indigenous fruit trees that you can collect any season and you can actually enjoy and that connects to what you are going to be produced. Imagine if uh, a local indigenous fruit tree was in Europe, where am I going, was I going to actually have access to that? And um, food is that nutrition that protects our health. For us to be moving and thinking and working so hard, we need to have food every day and that we have to understand understand its nutritional values. We believe again food is that social co uh, social cohesion medium that make us live together peacefully. When there is food, people are quiet, people will not fight, people will not disturb each other. So with this background, when we came into uh, 2000, we had to try to walk the talk and try to showcase what really uh, could, this could be achieved when Zimbabweans have gone on to the new land and what should be, uh, what do we mean when we are talking about total agrarian reform such that we have to achieve food sovereignty in our own communities. We came in uh, into an area that is called the Shasha block of farms where um, it is actually bordering Ward 6 and 33 of Mashingo Road District Council in Mashingo Province and to the north of Mashingo District. And this is a very dry land that receives less than 400 millimeters. We are actually in region form. And when we came in, we had a formal resettlement program that was actually formalized by government, where officially we had 380 farmers that were, uh, form of, uh, were, were resettled on 15,020 hectares, which make up the six farms of the Shashe local farms, where each small farmer was given eight hectares of land for homestead development and arable. And, we were, in total, we can see that we had to, we, our homesteads and Arab were actually occupying 400 hectares. And this being a dry land, there was that reservation of 11,000 hectares for grazing livestock. But when we get on to this new land, we were led by this process by a non-governmental organization, a grassroots, in fact, that was called the Association of Zimbabwe Traditional Environmental Conservationists, whereby there was this lot of talking about reviving spirituality and cosmovision into, into Zimbabwe and to make Zimbabwe a spiritually connected community and where we have to understand the fundamentals of what we say are the three worlds yeah, when we're talking about the three worlds here, we are referring that connection between the natural world where you talk about flora and fauna and then within flora and fauna, that's where you find even the food crops, they are actually part of it. And these are actually connected to different ecosystems. And we have also indigenous trees and livestock and wildlife, which then have a lot to doing with our nutrition. And this is again connected to a society where we talk about the, the social world, how that society is connected, be it of a clan, be it of a, 
of a, an ethnic group and how is that connected together to actually understand their environment and under, understand their soils and understand how they have to survive is what they've inherited. Then we have the spiritual world, which we, are, we actually talk about that we cannot see, which is very much connected to the spirit that is within our bodies and how that has to, uh, to connect to each other and how that has, has to influence even what I'm going to eat and even what I'm going to, to prepare for the spirit. Like, for example, in Zimbabwe, we have what we call traditional ceremonies where we specifically use finger millet. We cannot use maize when we are performing our rituals and we cannot go and buy the rule is that you need to collect it from your own granary. So it has to have that importance and value that it is produced from my own soils. So this we looking at it as a, um, a movement that was targeting to achieve total agrarian land reform based on fundamentals of the three worlds. So we had some mobilization issues. Yeah, one of those, you know, when Zimbabwe's economy started to decline, all the inputs actually had to go up. And what was the local solution? Farmers they became uh, they began to prioritize uh, um, making a lot of manure such that they can fertilize their soils. And farmers had to look at a lot of work to revive their local seed systems instead of going buying seed maize from the shop, but they had to look at their own local seed varieties. Because we, we were living in a very dry community, we had to start to work a lot on harvesting as much water as possible. And because we collect, we were resettled where there were lots of indigenous trees, we realized that it was also very, very important as a community that we protect these indigenous tree species. Their food values and their herbal and medicinal values are actually very, very important to our own health. And that is food to us. And we also in, tried to, in, to integrate quite a lot of livestock, uh, large and small, and developing what we call centers of excellence. These centers now trying to, to enhance our uh, mobilization in as far as reviving our local food systems as, con, as con, is concerned, such that we can defend our sovereignty and we can defend what we were going to survive on as a community. And to connect ourselves, we had to do a lot of rituals and ceremonies, this being performed in each community. And there was a lot of dialogue uh, focusing on the value of our own food systems and the development of our own local economies such that we are able to survive in a country that was almost like on a, in an embargo. We had to, again, uh, do all the rituals and ceremonies using the utensils that you can see on the photo and the crops that you can see. And these are all homemade. They are not bought from any shop. They've never traveled any, any mile, but they are just available at local level. And we had to perform a certain rituals. And these rituals are actually being performed in the forest and bring a lot of food values, like yeah, this example of Thanksgiving ceremony. Right, and we had some positive results that we, we actually achieved, uh, like the practices of agroecology. You can see myself here on very in a healthy food crop and a food forest, and you can see um, my other colleague here again in the food forest, and you can see uh, the different food crops that we study. I mean, the different techniques and practices on what are this thing that we had to, to employ and the seed varieties that we had to started to collect and to bring closer to our homesteads, the small grains, the traditional grains that have a lot of nutrition and the practices that we ended up integrating in as far as soil fertility management is of that value to produce our own local food. We also looked at increasing seed diversity and get, getting different seeds, crops from different farmers and trying to set this into seed, uh, seed banks at local level and uh, organizing seed and food fairs such that farmers can start to understand the value of producing their own food and producing it from their own seed that is local and mobilizing the young younger generation again to participate and during food and seed festivals. And Coming on now with a practice on horizontal learning where we had to organize much larger scale such that at least the practice can spread into the different communities in Zimbabwe, like as an organization in the Zimbabwe Small Organic Farmers Forum. We have four clusters that we are working with and our way of working 
is when we have to mobilize and understand the farmers showcasing and making sure that the examples are understood and connecting to the a global peace and movement of La Via Campesina as a member that we are actually very, very much proud to be part of um, La Via Campesina and we believe that's the way to go. And that is important if we talk about food sovereignty and we talk about our localization of our food systems, that's the way to go and that's how we can maintain our nutrition and then keep our bodies very healthy. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you. So for me, hearing both of you is like music to my ears. And I, for 45 years, have been trying to raise awareness about how the dominant economic part, what's been called progress, has been destroying small farmers systematically for generations. It started with slavery, it started with enclosures, and it, it started from the very beginning with global traders getting so much control over essentially the, the entire globe. Early on, as people were driven off the land in Europe to become cheap labor in industry, in urban industry, in the so-called third world, people were driven away from that basic food self-reliance to produce on large monocultures whether coffee or tea or cotton. Now, we believe that today there is no more important issue than for us all to step back and look at the big picture to understand that that trajectory of giving too much power to global traders has continued unabated, basically. There have been some attempts to modify the impact and for instance, in my native country of Sweden, where this urbanizing, industrializing, globalizing part was also taking place, there was a government generally in Scandinavia and in several other countries that tried to shield people from the worst effects of what was fundamentally destructive of the human spirit and of nature. So, we are trying to say in local futures and with our work of launching World Localization Day, we're trying to say we must step back now and understand that around the world, people are very clearly showing that they want to move back towards nature, particularly in the parts of the world where people have tasted the loneliness, the emptiness of high rise urban living. And more recently with COVID, where they've noticed that it's a rather unhealthy way to organize society, to drive people into larger and larger cities, more and more distance from the living world, and paradoxically, removed from each other as we've been shoved on top of each other, we actually don't know each other's names. We don't look at one another in the eyes because we are no longer interdependent. We are no longer interdependent through human scale structures, which previously for our entire time on this planet shaped who we were. We evolved in human scale, intergenerational community and that I won't go into a great deal of detail about that but I do want to say that from Gabor Mate to other well-known voices about the increase in trauma particularly in the western world there is that recognition that being cut off from intergenerational collaborative structures is fundamental in depriving children of a sense of belonging, of real life role models that provide them with a healthy, secure identity. So we have this major crisis today. In the West, I would say the epidemics of depression, anxiety, and even suicide should you know, urge us to really question why, where from, now, in addition to that, we have an epidemic of 
health crisis, physical health crisis, cancer is escalating geometrically. We now have pandemics. And when we step back and look at the dominant trajectory, which pushed people away from the land into bigger and bigger cities, we will see that the industrial ways of farming, which as Andre was saying, were built on monocultures for export, those monocropping techniques poison and destroy the land and our food. Monocropping, monocultural production for export, in a sense, is the enemy, is what makes farming drudgery and a toxic uh, lifestyle for the farmers. It's what creates the need for the fungicides, the pesticides, the herbicides, and the genetic engineering in order to keep going that, down that path of creating bigger and bigger scale monocrops for the traders. That is responsible for the major health crisis, physical health crisis as well, which is escalating very rapidly. Right now we're standing at a crossroads where there is actually a, a visible micro trend, or rather I should say plural, micro trends around the world where people are showing that they actually want to reestablish a connection with the land. They actually want to reestablish a connection to community. COVID has furthered this um, movement and this desire, but it had already started happening before that. A very clear pattern where those who had been isolated in that man-made world of the high-rise big cities started developing a love for, a need for nature. Now, this is now happening in Beijing and in the big cities of the world, the entire world. But it's particularly strong in the Western world where so many people have been so isolated from and separated from nature. And I am finding with my 45 years of work around the world in, in many, many countries and speaking a lot of languages that the most inspiring, the most life-affirming and joyous trend is the trend of young people leaving their screen jobs in the city to go to farm. Of course, there are other things that are happening that are very important, but I would say there is nothing that is happening that simultaneously heals the human spirit, heals human connecting community, the fabric of community while healing nature. It is what basically constitutes a global local food movement. It's small, it's fragile, and everything Nelson is trying to do in Zimbabwe is fragile because all of these initiatives go counter to the dominant economic system that sadly our governments are locked into supporting right now. I would argue that this blind adherence to an outdated path of ever larger industrial scale monocultures for export, which by the way, includes importing and exporting the same food product, because if nations moved towards greater food sovereignty, if regions did and nations did, giant multinational corporations and banks would not be making all that money the power would be decentralized. And what I started talking about was this health, the joy of this new farmers movement, which is completely linked to more localized structures because we need to shorten the distance between the farm and the table in order to create markets that pressure towards diversification. Diversification is what the land needs. And uh, we will be having a bit of a discussion after this uh, because this diversification ideally will include animals. And it's a very difficult message in the West right now, but I'm hoping that Westerners who are concerned, well, who are concerned with climate and the mountains of plastic and the epidemics of depression and the tragic sort of 
you know, rise in cancer, the toxic, unhealthy food, Two minutes to go. The, the epidemics of diabetes and so on. People who are concerned with that hopefully will be willing to listen to the voices of hundreds of millions of small holders in the less industrialized part of the world, hundreds of millions. We so urgently need that deeper dialogue between the more industrialized and the less industrialized parts of the world so that together we can collaborate to start shifting direction this is not about condemning people who live in the city. It's not even about condemning the people in big corporations. This is about a vision, a systemic understanding that what humanity needs to do and really must do and wants to do is to reconnect to the living world. There's so much evidence don't have time now to go into it, but <laughs> countless examples of the healing that occurs to people, to their spiritual, psychological well being, and to their physical well being as they connect to the land and to community. And when they're privileged enough to be part of these small, fragile local economy structures, they are able to engage in meaningful, productive work while learning from their consumers how appreciated that delicious, healthier, fresh food is. So thank you very much. And now I hope three of us can have a little bit of a discussion and then we look forward to getting some questions. Thank you. Andrea Nelson, are you there? I'm just fighting with the yes, yes. video to get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nelson, are you there? Yes, I'm around. Okay, good. But we, we're good if we can see you now also, I think. I mean, one, actually, I want to tackle yeah. a, really, a really difficult question. It's so, so hard because I myself for many, many years was vegetarian. I did not like the idea of killing an animal. And so I felt it was the ethical thing to do to be vegetarian. But what I came to realize working with many traditional cultures and traditional farmers was how vitally important it was to have animals in the whole cycle. And I also lived in indigenous cultures where every life was taken with huge conscious appreciation of life and a clarity about what it means to take life. It wasn't done blindly and cruelly generally. So I wonder if, if you have some thoughts about that, Nelson. I don't know if you've seen you know, the rise of veganism in the West and the, the tragedy of many people believing that eating plastic meat is the way forward. Nelson, did you hear my question? Not really, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, was, I was saying that I see a big problem now with veganism being pushed very strongly in the Western world because people understandably don't want to kill animals and they are being also led to believe that the human footprint would be smaller if we didn't consume animals. But it's because they don't know that in really productive, biodiverse farming systems, we can actually be more productive if animals are included in the cycle. Yes. Yeah, I will give an example of Africa. In Africa, we, we have um, what we call totems. Our totems are all related to uh, certain wild species like I am of the rock rabbit, right? and that's a speech that we need to protect as, as a people. And that's the value that we also give to each and every speech in the, in, the, in the biodiversity. And we have that relation to live in harmony with nature, where we have to value all flora and fauna. And we have to utilize what is what we believe is supposed to be utilized. We, we utilize we have what we call taboos. 
the do's and don'ts that we need to respect certain species and that's how we survive with animals so we if this movement where this wave where everybody is supposed to think from the western kind of thinking and thinking that is what is civilization but our traditional belief systems were quite fundamental in as far as conservation of biodiversity is concerned Yes, and I think this, what's very frightening is that what's being considered civilized is actually what is profitable to giant corporations and banks uh, in creating dependence. And after COVID, there's recognition that the global supply chains are very vulnerable. And this is a way of localizing by creating what we see as the biggest threat to humanity right now, which is a shift into an AI dominated urban world where 100% of the population will be urbanized and where the, the propaganda now is that drones, robots and linked to satellites monitoring carbon will feed the world. And it's a, it's a very, very important issue now that we step back and question that. And Andre, do you want to say something about that also? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, for, for me, um, I have a lot of good vegan friends and, I, and I, I believe everybody has a right to choose their lifestyle, the types of foods they want to eat. And in no way do I want to be seen as anti-vegan. And you know, and you can be a vegan by you know eating pulses and fresh vegetables. You don't need to eat mass-produced plastic food. You know the fake meats. This this is the issue now. You know you have to actually ask if you're going to be a vegan. And you, and you don't want to eat animal products. Why do you want to eat things that taste and feel like animal products that have fake blood on it? You know, it, 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 it just does not make sense. But the main thing here is that these products come from the worst of all monocultures. We're talking about GMO maize, GMO soy that sprayed with carcinogens like glyphosate. They um, come from, you know, what, what people don't understand is that the majority of land that is cleared in the world at the moment is cleared for industrial GMO crops. So whacking down the Amazon to grow these GMO maize and, and uh, GMO corn, putting in big boats to go up and uh, to these factories and you know, part of it, I suppose, so the other side of the argument too is what I'll call the confined animal feeding operations. They, you know, they are a major problem. But the other part is that um, these mass-produced toxic um, products are going into these factories, and then on top of that, they've got these vats with GMO organisms making this fake blood and making a um, these fake meats that haven't been tested and where we do have a little bit of testing, they, they are actually very dangerous for your health. And then I, I just want to say the other side of it to me is um, industrial confined animal feeding systems. Th th these, are, these are the concentration camps for animals that are absolutely cruel and we need to stop them. What we need to go back to is animals living naturally in nature the way that they want and having a life where they can express themselves without any cruelty. That is what we can do in um, agroecological systems. Regenerative and that's systems. also what's happening in more localized systems, both you know, traditional and some of the modern ones. What I think is worrying is that so much of the, the vegans are often very intolerant of people who are working with animals or producing meat, even when it's done in a very gentle and highly sustainable way. And that's where I think we have to really get the message out that if we want to shrink the human footprint, 
if we actually want to do the minimal harm and allow more wildlife, allow for you know water to become cleaner again, actually we would reduce our footprint more effectively if there were some animals in the cycle, in the food cycle. Even things like ducks eat weeds and rice paddies and uh, numerous ways, you know, in traditional smallholder farming too, animals would never compete with humans. They would never be eating, again, as you say, this mass produced stuff. So it's a very, very thorny and difficult issue. And it's, it's, it is just one that I think really will require much more of a people's civic society discussion and more tolerance on both sides. I completely agree with you, Andre, that I would never want to tell someone you must eat meat, but people need to know that what they're seeing in these films, talking about the horrors of the animal uh, feeds is the industrial corporate for profit system. It's not a system that's ever been about feeding people. And there's no doubt it's the most cruel, it's the most horrific, it's the one thing that should be stopped immediately. It's completely unpardonable. Yeah. Helena, maybe, I think that's one thing, yeah. sorry, but I think one thing all of us can agree on is that these confined animal feeding systems must be banned. This sort of animal cruelty has no place on our planet. On the other hand, what, what people also, don't realise is... But sorry. also, let's keep in mind all the time that where all these things come together is where we are allowing our governments to service giant global corporations instead of promoting what is healthy for people, healthy for the animals, healthy for the planet. And where things are so uh, clear is when we start localizing, then suddenly people wake up to so many of these issues because you can see with your own eyes, you can actually see the farm where there might be some animals involved. You can see the benefits of reducing the plastic and the packaging and the long distances. And suddenly food and farming becomes about food while healing the land. So I think, um, Nelson, did you want to add something before we go to taking some questions? I'm okay. Yeah, I, I yeah. okay. I just so, wanted yeah. to add one other thing. So, yeah? I just add one other thing here which sure. is in this debate. The people, you know, the debate about um, essentially veganism is based on cropping systems that uh, pertain really to the, the global north. Whereas when we look at agricultural systems, 68% of them are actually rangelands. And these, we're talking traditional commu communities that have always you know, looked after animals, cattle herders, camel her herders. Um, and there's about, around the world, there's about 2 billion people who are dependent on ranging animals. If we stop this system, we cause poverty and starvation to two billion people. What we need to do is, you know, these systems are primarily local systems anyway. We need to now start working with them and helping them do these systems better, managing the rangelands better. This is where yeah, resources. Well, yeah, need but to go. Andre, I, yeah, I would say I just want to say from my point of view as a Westerner. It's not so much about us going into the so-called third world and teaching people how to do things better. It's much more about our sharing knowledge about how disastrous this Western industrial model has been so that people themselves can choose what really makes sense in their own environments. The biggest frightening thing that's happening, as Nelson, I know you will know, is that Young children are being made to feel that farming is backward, stupid, primitive. Parents are being made to feel that the best thing they can do is go into debt to send their child to school so that they can become an engineer in the city. So this, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah the, can you say the, something about that? The, the, the clerks of the matter is actually coming from the uh, value that has been attached to food, the situation whereby food has been commodified. And if you are a family of five and you are buying a plate of $5, uh, 
and you are eating three times, you can calculate the mathematics and see how much you are going to eat even out of the whole year, you know, you know, and that is real business. But now agriculture is not being made sexy for the young people to understand it. You know, that if you see a book of agriculture, you will see a very old lady with a very uh, dull face and with total tattered clothing to indicate that it is not a, a business that anyone can look at and start to live onto it. And this is whereby the corporates have now come in with the mono kind of a program because they are specializing on specific crops which is making business which are making business for them and but how do we dismantle such a process we need to go back to the grassroots and we need to mobilize the smallholder farmers to really understand the issues behind the politics of food systems must be understood by the consumers they must know what they are eating and why they are eating it and who is driving that kind of a food you see in that agenda is this to, is to be then supported by our governments they would need to understand that they need just not to bring in onto the people some crazy ideas that might come like climate smart agriculture what is smart into it and what is it when it is carrying poisons you know at the background and when it is milking the smallholder farmer and when it is bringing food which is not consumable to the farmer so those are the issues that we need to be very clear about and build ourselves and protect the the farmers as well as the consumers yeah and you know you were saying that there you see you know these images of old people doing the farming and it's just meant basically it's described in india as backward and stupid and in the school books yeah. they actually say we have to do everything we can to get these poor ignorant farmers into the city they have to get educated and get in the city so this again is an issue that i feel is very poorly understood in the west and where I feel a lot of the grassroots education will benefit from the sort of international dialogue that we're having now, you know, whether it's about schooling or about animals or the, the sort of reality on the ground um, on both sides. Because in Zimbabwe and in India, young people are led to believe that people in the Western cities are the happiest of all and they have this incredible life and they never have to work and they end up developing an inferiority complex. And again, it's through that deeper dialogue, they'll realize, no, yes. actually, the, the epidemic of depression and, and anxiety and, and drug addiction and so on is much greater than in these rural communities. Yeah. So now I'm sort of trying to see, I can't actually see these questions so well. Do you think people lecture the third world and do the completely opposite themselves? Is that what someone's there? Well, in my case, certainly I'm, I'm not a farmer and I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know how I would manage as a farmer, but I can tell you I am not lecturing in the, in the global South any more than I am in the West. I'm working with farmers on both sides of the world to try to restore food systems that literally heal the planet and restore wildlife while healing people. So I have absolutely no hesitation whatsoever to put that message out. And the message is not that every single one of us right now should become a farmer. In fact, I feel we have a great need for advocates for this type of healthy agriculture. So that's another important issue to think about. But sorry, now I'm, DeAndre, did you want to say something about that? The only thing I wanted to say is that, you know, for a start, I am a farmer. I've had a lifetime of farming. And in many cases, and I suppose I, I've been to more than 100 countries around on every continent talking with farmers. And as a farmer, you know, I might get invited to speak, but I'm not there to preach. Which, and I can tell you, particularly in my roles, when I get invited to, to speak, um, more importantly, I want to learn and listen and understand. And I think this is the really important thing I think the big issue is is where we get NGOs coming in and parachuting in experts and imposing systems instead of um, working out working with the local people 
learning what they want. And then if you bring in something, it's about empowering them to make their decisions and work out the best way to do it. It's very, very different from top-down lecturing. We need to do it bottom-up. What we're trying to do, you know, those of us that live in, 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 in the richer countries, is wealth distribution. And, and, and you know, we've, we've been privileged to bring some of that to help others, but not lecture them and preach them, but help them use these resources to empower themselves, come up with their own solutions. And I think for me, you know, what I loved about hearing about Nelson and what you're doing in Zimbabwe, that, it, you know, it's exactly the way to do things. It's such an inspiring story, Nelson, what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And I, there's someone there, Rebecca, asking how can we, basically, how can we get the word out about this so that more people understand it? And I guess, Nelson, you would agree that you know, part of what you're trying to do both in Zimbabwe and internationally is to yes. spread the word. That is, uh, it's all about making connections. Yeah? Like we, we as members of La Via Campesina and we are right here in Zimbabwe and there are also members in Europe of Via Campesina and there is this um, intercultural dialogues that are always happening. And this is how the message is actually spreading. But we are fighting a, a, a huge um, um, animal here, which is which is the corporate, and they are using money, yeah, and they are using capital, you know, as as their weapon, and which which you find is quite limited into practices that actually are parallel to their systems. And how do we move? We that's why we in La Pia Campesina we call these struggles. You know, we need to continue to struggle, like you have indicated that we cannot all the farmers we have different expertise with different skills at all together so we need to bring all this together to the researchers the academia the farmers the, uh, the, 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 the and the fisher folks and all the, the people together and that have that healthy dialogue to try to spread the message across the world yeah that's i, th I think that emphasis on spreading the message and how we can have the resources to do that. It takes some funding. It takes attention to spreading the word as opposed to actually doing the farming and doing the models. We need both. But I find that too often there is not enough focus from the grassroots mm -hmm. on how can we get the word out? How can we create the films? How can we create the educational toolkits? Uh, is this something that we've tried to do in our organization? Because as you were also saying, Nelson, uh, we need to be putting enough pressure so that we will have policy change. Um, we can start from the bottom up to implement these things, but if these policies continue to allow financial institutions to make money out of thin air, that's what we're up against, is that the ignorance in our whole society now has lost touch with the fact that this fake money does not represent any real wealth. And where does the real wealth come from? Primarily from farmers and you know, fishermen and forester, the primary production, that's ultimately where we get everything we need. That's the real wealth. But we're living now in this world with this fake money, it is fake. And we have allowed the deregulation of the financial system to continue even after 2008. Now, unfortunately, what I'm talking about here is not something that many people are gonna get involved with, but we, we desperately need people to go all the way from that soil and seed and water to the financial system and and have an understanding of where the real wealth is and the real power. Ultimately, you know, I think you would agree, Nelson, that ultimately the power is with us because we have the numbers. We are the 99%, actually more than that. Um, <laughs> and I also just want to say that when I see these tiny, you know, the smaller farms, the local markets, communities coming together, prisoners, addicts, healing from having the opportunity 
to learn how to grow something. I just, I, you know, it is, it is this amazing healing of people and planet. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you want to say something about that too, Nelson? I hope I'm not talking too much. There's a comment, a question about GMOs and GE products. Yeah. Also, someone was commenting, Andrew, that you had this slide about training and agroecological practices supporting traditional practices, but we only saw it very briefly. Is it possible yeah. to see it again? And, yeah, okay, um, look, I, I did it for time purposes, but I could, yeah. if, if, you, if people are happy, I can quickly share the screen and, and go back to that slide. I'm happy with that. Are you, Nelson, also? Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Won't take me long. Um, okay. So what, what, what I put in this slide here is just that basically what all we really need to do, you know, we we're talking about um, money, is instead of, you know, Billions that are wasted in things like like like, like pesticides, fertilizer companies, you know, it's about training. And I think, um, you know, the, the best one too for us is what we call farmer to farmer, campesina, e campesina. Um, and you know, so so it's not top down, it's level, it's spread out, you know. But you know what? the basic things that we can do is one is respect traditional farming the big trouble with industrial agriculture they just throw it out they say oh it's primitive and it's, it, it you know but these systems we're talking about ten thousand year old systems we're talking about incredible diversity of seeds that have been developed you know um that are locally adapted they're the highest yielding seeds under these systems and so we start working with that and then just start teaching basic things about soil nutrition, particularly recycling organic matter. You know, you saw what Nelson was doing with all the animal manure in um, Zimbabwe, exactly that. Um, improved pest and disease control. You know, they're really simple systems that don't have to be based on pesticides. Water use efficiency and especially by increasing soil organic matter. And that increases the amount of water you capture and how long it lasts. It's a really good way of drought proofing. Um, better weed management. And when I'm saying this, I'm not talking about weed eradication. It's actually learning how to use weeds as cover crops. It's rethinking the system. And then, you know, why we like agroecology is because it is about bringing in biodiversity into the system. The more biodiversity, the more resilience. And by putting these in, we, we can get significant increases in yield. And I wanted to give the example that we're talking here, not 10 or 20%. You know, the evidence base shows that we can get more than 100%. When you go into communities like this and we turn it around, um, I can tell you, you know, communities in Kenya I've been to where um, bringing in things like push-pull, kitchen gardens, you know, these were communities where, you know, there were months where people were, you know, were starving. I remember one village I was in and I was walking down the creek and there, you know, people know a taro is a type of elephant here and it's a black one. And I said, do you eat that? And I go, no, it's poisonous, you know. Um, except for we do use it as famine food. And I said, well, how, how do you use it as famine food if it's poisonous? He goes, well, what we do is we get the shubas and boil it and just keep on boiling it all night long until the children fall asleep. And, you know, it, it still brings tears to my eyes. But what, what I want to say is this is what we're dealing with. And then you turn around, you go to these people, they have nice houses, they can educate their children, they, you know, it's, it's a game changer. Another story I was told is about how, you know, the women could go out and buy nice clothing. And you go, oh, that's interesting. And then you find out 
because they were so poor and their clothing had holes in it, they felt like they were indecent and they didn't socialise. Now that they had nice dresses, they socialise. When the women socialise, you get community and having happiness and prosperity. It's not, you know, what we're talking about when Nelson said food on the table is central to it. You, you build this prosperity, the sense of community, the sense of joie de vie, you know, it's just, um, you know, and you see this change. It's incredible. And, you know, what, what gets me for the cost of one GMO, we could feed, we could change all of Africa tomorrow. It's as simple as that. The amount of money that's wasted, there's no need for this violent poverty. You know, I, I, I actually get angry about it when we know what we can do and what we have achieved with just a little bit of money if it went our way. I see here a comment about Sweden and I'm afraid that, you know, I've lived through the changes in traditional cultures, for instance, in Ladakh and Bhutan where I worked for many years and I've seen that the dominant narrative simply lies, it, but it isn't lying through a conscious line. It was people who wanted to promote chemical fertilizers, DDT, underestimating traditional yields, never actually measuring them and underestimating them grossly. Now that underestimate, underestimating includes in many countries still, small farmers are not even in the census. And when we get to hear about productivity, we actually get to hear about how much money those crops have made. We don't have a proper anywhere, a really proper measure of what was produced for people to nourish them without destroying the soil. So those systems that go back thousands of years and that managed to be thoroughly sustainable, we have no proper evaluation of them because from the beginnings of the modern era, particularly coming in with fossil fuels, the benefits were exaggerated. And I would say that definitely happened in Sweden as well. What we need to understand is that whether in Ireland or in Sweden at a certain point, once you had allowed rulers to dominate and, and even, even a bit before the major industrial agriculture was brought in, when you had colonial in effect, you know, slave owners in the non-Western world and when you had huge landowners in the West who were taking advantage of the rest of the population for their own ends, then you did see the creation of famine and problems, but it was linked to the global trading system. So again, with the bigger picture, we will see how and why we now have a world where so few people are getting so rich and how it is that the majority of people are working harder and faster than ever before just to stay in place. But I um, hope again that wasn't too long winded, but it, it, it does mean that we do need to step back and go to the time before Dickensian London, and as I say, before the potato famine in Ireland, and we see the buildup of the creation of poverty. And, and remember, it's concomitant with an impoverishment of the land. So rich landowners even change the varieties for grazing for them to have an advantage and dominate. So when you go back historically, it's very interesting to see how this lack of genuine democratic and equal social justice structures are linked to the destruction of the environment. And we can see all of this more clearly in the food system than anywhere else. Nelson, I'm just interested oh. in, you know, what you're doing, you know, I just think is, is fabulous. Are you seeing, you know, it's spreading out, scaling out more and more farmers, uh, you know, starting to adopt what you're doing in Zimbabwe. The first oh, you're on, Nelson, you're yes. on mute. Yeah. yeah, I was on mute. Sorry. Uh, 
uh, the first measurement on how we are seeing the progress, how we are seeing many people adopting is uh, the numbers of households that are coming now to display their seed diversities, right, at household level. And the varieties, the number of varieties that each farmer is beginning to recover. Uh, some could be, have been just lost and people may be concentrating on maize for the past 10 years, but now they're reducing the hectare, you know, they, they, are, they have been growing maize and trying to integrate other important food crops that they, uh, they like to eat as a family. And that measurement is quite interesting for us. And we also measuring the whole idea I talked about on the development of centers of excellence. These are very important um, uh, farmer-led uh, centers where the farmer is developing his own family farm into a learning center such that other farmers, they may, might come to learn from best practices and they begin also to practice uh, such uh, activities at their own household. And that is then leading quite a lot in terms of the horizontal spreading of it. And at the same time, there is also a lot of deepening of uh, understanding the issues like the case of uh, climate. It is actually naturally pushing farmers to begin to understand that it's a real situation that is affecting us. And what is the solution? There are some farmers that have been, that have very interesting living innovations that really other farmers easily can get there and they start to learn and then they, they begin to put into practice and we're seeing numbers of farmers increasing but the stamping block is uh, the, the the policy that is very missing you know as farmers continue to do and build masses at their own level our expectation was that we need to also see our policies that will have to support what exactly are the farmers are doing and that helps to then increase the numbers very much. I see some questions here that are connected and one of them is how on earth are we going to get these corporates to let go of their stranglehold? And then someone else was saying, you know, how can this happen quickly enough? What we want to see, how can we make this shift? And then someone else was saying, you know, here you're talking to the converted at ORFC. We need to be getting articles into the media. Well, I want people to know that we certainly have tried to get things into the media around this issue of what's happening to small farmers to local food sovereignty. We have been trying for 40 years. And Via Campesina, I have been all over the world speaking about Via Campesina, trying to raise awareness about them because they've not been in the media. And we have also been you know, basically shadow banned also by Facebook. It's extremely difficult to get this picture out beyond these circles. And I would say even in ORFC today, there are these wonderful presentations and a huge vast knowledge about how to grow more healthily in terms of beekeeping and organic and biodynamic, agroecological. From my point of view, there isn't enough of the discussion about the need to change the market, that the market needs to be closer to the farm. In other words, more localized, more decentralized. There's not even within this conference, I think enough of a discussion about that. And that's certainly where it would start. You know, if there were more people speaking strongly about that, clearly about it, it will get out eventually, but we're up against a corporate dominated media as we know. So it's not easy. However, we are also facing the reality that this accumulation of fake money, which is what it is. Our governments have allowed financial institutions to create, create money out of thin air. It is literally fake money. That, it doesn't represent real power. The real power that they have now is only real because we accept this. 
because we don't have enough of a discussion about economic literacy along with ecological literacy and that we need to bring the two together. And that discussion, I think it, it is happening for sure, it's growing, but it definitely needs to grow more and faster. Um, but I think, uh, I really do think there is a chance that we'll have a major wake up because things are getting so obscenely bad when in virtually every country, the wealthy, you know, fewer and fewer people with more and more billions, trillions, while the rest of people are, you know, even going hungry or in the West working harder and harder just to pay for the mortgage or the rent. But again, that global picture we need, generally we don't hear enough about that. We hear some people talking about poverty in the third world, but not enough about the impoverishment in the West because it's a people's movement that comes together globally that can and I think will have the power um, at some point uh, to insist on a, on a turn, on a policy turning. Um, but also please help to get the word out, getting the word out, spreading the word about this issue. As I said before, not enough people are engaged in that. Nelson, did you want to say something about that? I saw you were nodding your head. <laughs> oh, you were muted. Sure. Yes, oh, yes. I was mind. just listening to, uh, to, 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 to your words, you know, the, the, those are um, very important words. You know, it's not easy. We, we, uh, the topic that we are talking is a very huge threat to, to, the, to the corporates and it's uh, it's something that they also are very busy trying to destroy, and where they they, they find it maybe uh, maybe challenging, they try to co-opt it. Like in the case of agroecology, now they start to trying to co-opt some of the concept into into in, into the into the whole process, and uh, that's why within Via Campesina we say this peasant agroecology because it is based on the understanding of the peasant. What are the issues that are really affecting me and what is it that I have to, to, be, to be doing? But it's not a very easy path and it's not, it is very, very difficult to, to go and it has to be understood. And we need to build so many numbers, uh, you know, at the grassroots level, such that we have to reach to our governments and we have to reach to our regions and we have to also integrate um, uh, many different schools of thought that are really in support of this process, whereby we emphasize quite a lot about what we are eating and how it is uh, being produced and how it is in, in influencing our healthy uh, situations. And like, like I think um, uh, Andre has, has indicated that we are seeing a lot of these chronic diseases that are affecting the people. And what is it that is happening to protect ourselves? We have seen the, the, the coming of COVID and how much impact it has affected uh, the, the food miles and what were the people eating during all the lockdowns. You know, those are very important issues that we need now to think and try to localize some of our decisions. And I, we believe that if people who are concerned with climate change, who are concerned with the mountains of plastic, who are concerned with the cancer epidemic, with the pandemic, with poverty, with the spiritual tragic epidemic of meaninglessness and, and depression, addiction, suicide, if people can realize that all of these problems are actually linked and that a systemic shift in the direction we're talking about, that fundamentally the new economy can only be healthy if it understands food and farming. Food and farming as the primary vehicle of destruction in the hands of these corporate and as the primary vehicle of healing in the hands of smallholder, more diversified, localized food systems. So I think uh, it's this bigger picture of seeing the dots, connecting the dots. That's the the, the tricky, the tricky thing. And I, I personally believe we need more films. You know, we've tried to make some. The economics of happiness is one of them, but it's um, there are many, many uh, 
many, many films that should be made that would tackle it also more from an individual angle for people who are concerned about one of these various aspects, I think. Andre, I Ellen, think you want I, to say something. Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, in many ways what we've done, um, we're talking about all the problems, we have talked about what the solution is and you know, I, I think what I would like to do is end on the good news. You know, what Nelson is doing is a good news story, you know. And from my point of view, as someone who's had 45 years around the world, I can tell you there's lots at the grassroots level. It's happening on every continent. You know, it, it is truly a grassroots revolution. It's under the radar and in some ways that's what, that, that, that's why it can't be stopped. On the mm. other hand, you know, we do need to get the message out and particularly to, you know, what one I, I want to call is aware consumers. You know, they are the people we need to buy the products of farmers to understand, you know, the importance of going to local markets and not, 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 not to the Walmarts and, and, and the um, Costcos, you know. Um, and, but the fact is, we're starting to do it. I think one of the things that we did this year, and, and I say we, Regeneration International, and you were part of this, Helena, is that um, there was, oh, for a start, a lot of NGOs, and that included La Via, boycotted the United Nations Food Summit because it was hijacked by AGRA and the pesticide companies. And we decided, you know, or thousands of us as NGOs boycotted it. That was really good. What we did with Generation International then is put a, the, the Global People's Food Summit on, on World Food Day on October 16th. It's a 24-hour event because we've got over 400 partner organisations in 70 countries. So we started in Fiji, in the Pacific, you know, when, when, where the day starts and, and, and did 24 hours around the world with speakers from every region, every continent. Now, the UN summit, they boast that they got 10,000 people watching it online. A lot. We got over half a million. Actually, 512,000 people watching it now. And we know how to do it better. Next year, when we do it, we will get more than a million. And I, I think I want to say is that we're starting to understand how to use social media, use their tools to get our messages across. And I think this is a really positive thing. Uh, in many ways, I believe we're on the cusp of change and positive change. And as you say, I Helena, we I are the 99% and we will win. And I think, you know, this is our experience too. And for us, the launching of World Localization Day was exactly for that exact goal, Andre, you know, to make visible and to celebrate the worldwide localization movement and with a particular focus on local food at the center of this transition. And absolutely, we are finding that literally all around the world, people are taking these initiatives. They, there's an intuitive turning in the West and in the westernized cities of the third world where people just want to reestablish that connection. There is that growing awareness that obesity and high blood pressure, cancer are connected to this toxic corporate food and people are turning towards local healthy food. And that is absolutely happening. However, I think we should be, I think the fair thing to say to people is, Please help us to make that movement visible. Please also open your eyes to it because it's a question of changing your lenses. Once you start becoming aware of how fundamentally important these local food initiatives are, and you'll start looking around the area where you live, you will see things moving in the right direction towards the healing of people and planet. However, we have to be aware and be honest that tragically our governments are still locked, or the majority of governments anyway, are locked into a blind support of the opposite direction. And so I would say, you know, in the next four or five years, uh, we will 
you know, either be in, in so much more trouble than we are now, or we will more clearly be seeing this turning towards the local. And I, I just want to stress also that local as a as an little word to cover an entire systemic transition for many people, particularly on the left, can look like some kind of withdrawal and retreat and some sort of selfish protectionism. No, this is a global movement where every community on this planet should have the right to respect their own environment, their own knowledge, their own seed varieties, and as a priority, use food to feed themselves, not to feed the profit of giant corporations. So this is this is the movement, and this is what we, you know, what local futures is about, what World Localization Day is about, what Regeneration International is trying to do, what Nelson, what you're doing with Zimsoft and Via Campesina. And I, I really hope that we will see more people concerned, as I say, with these multiple issues, coming to see this as a central and vitally important direction forward. I think um, we should, Nelson, do you have some final words that you would like to say to people who are with us? Yes. Um... Definitely, I think we need to move with a quite in some speed if we would want to uh, to have a shift in the way we see what we are eating and in the way we see how we are producing it and in the way that we even challenge the the, the corporate and try to put our our facts on the table through various platforms and uh, also participate where there is a lot of dialogues that relates to uh, localization of our food, uh, food systems and the value that we get out of it and which is very, very much um, to me a very important discussion that we have had and which I think uh, our colleagues that could be listening uh, you know, right now could be also begin to think much closer to how they are actually consuming and what they are consuming and who is producing that food for themselves. Uh, and are they quite are they active? And if they are not, if they like what we are discussing, this is the chance now to make that transformation and be quite active on supporting localization of our food systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to, and thanks to everyone. Uh, we need to be stopping promptly because there are new sessions coming up. And so both, yeah, thanks so much to, to Lauren and Brittany and to ORFC for letting us do the session. And Thank thanks so much, Andre and Nelson. We'll be in touch soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.